Hi, this is Sue Glenn, and we're going to talk a little bit about the human population growth and uh, the structure of the human population. Uh, I am doing this for my ecology class. We're basing it on the textbook by Manuel Moles and Anna Scher, which is called Ecology Concepts and Applications. It's published by McGraw Hill, and uh, it's I'm using the eighth edition, which was published in 2019. This is in chapter 11, which is the last section where they apply to have an application section on the human population. And the picture here, that's Rabbit Island in uh, Japan, which has got a huge population of rabbits. So we've already talked about exponential growth in previous videos, and we talked about uh, logistic growth in previous videos. Uh, and so if you remember uh, with logistic growth, uh, if we look at over time and the population size, the population will start growing exponentially then it will uh, start to level off at its carrying capacity. So this is population size, and that's time. And that is the logistic growth model. It's kind of like a, a sigmoidal shaped curve. Uh, we meet the assumptions. The logistic model assumes that you're continuous breeder, so you can breed constantly. You don't just like do like an annual plant where you uh, breed once and then you die. Um, and our growth is limited, so we can't make a decision. Are we going to put our energy into getting taller, or are we going to put our energy into reproduction? Um, our, our ability to get taller is obviously somewhat limited. So just an example of uh, trying to look at this as a logistic growth uh, equation. Pearl and Reed in 1920 took the US census data that had been collected until 1920, and they fitted a logistic growth curve to the graph to show that uh, uh, the projected uh, future growth in the U.S. and to determine what the carrying capacity for the United States would be. And so here's the data they had um, up until 1920. So we have uh, the year across the x-axis. The y-axis is population size, which is going to be, in this case, in millions. Um, and at that point, it had uh, got to around 100 million people. So then you uh, put in curve for the logistic growth, and we can see a carrying capacity somewhere around 200 million. How many people are in the United States now? It is definitely over 300 million. Uh, they were wrong, and they, you know you figure it out pretty quickly that it is not leveling off to the carrying capacity, but instead you are getting much more of an exponential growth curve going on here. So are we immune to the forces of nature that govern other species? So we, when we talked about logistic growth, we talked about density dependent effects that come into play when a population gets more dense and more crowded, competition for food, competition for resources, competition um, for a nice clean place to live, you foul our environment and uh, and diseases spread, and it is 2020. So why have we continued to grow exponentially? And actually, when we look at the shape of the human population growth curve, uh, it is not just exponential, it is steeper than exponential. So across the x-axis, we have the year from the year zero, year 2000 here. Um, up the y-axis, we have the human population uh, in billions, and we are now over seven, uh, 7 billion people, so we're somewhere around here. Um, and uh, so we're about at this point in this curve. So this is uh, projected to go uh, beyond where we are at this point. We're at 2020. And uh, But we can see that this curve is very steep. This is uh, steeper than we expected. It means that our population growth rate has increased over human history. And you can think about uh, the, the population growth rate is the birth rates minus the death rates. And we've done a very good job of bringing down the death rates. And so we're living longer. And, uh, and in that case, you can see that this, uh, as you bring down the death rates, 
that growth rates are going to be increasing. Here's some estimates of the human population growth rate throughout human history. So before 1650, it was 0 0.00002, which uh, if we did it as a percentage, it's, it's still, <laughs> it's still 0 0.002. Uh, growth rate, uh, percent growth. Uh, then at 1650 to 1750, we can see it dramatically increased. 1750 to 1850, it was up to 0.5%. And then it got up to 0.8%. And then now it's, I believe it's 0 0.0125. So it is uh, around 1.25% a year. So our growth rate has gone um, in addition to that, when we look at where we live, we are not evenly distributed uh, around the planet. We occupy all continents. Even Antarctica has a small population of scientists that, that uh, live there, but uh, they need a lot of technology to live in Antarctica. But we spread throughout the planet um, after the end of the uh, last ice age. We were pretty well um, colonizing um, everything but some of the most uh, isolated oceanic islands and and those obviously had to wait for um, the Polynesians and the Europeans to improve their abilities to navigate in the oceans uh, but we are clumped and uh, obviously we can see that uh, uh, 4.2 billion people uh, are living in Asia which uh, has obviously around 60% of the the world's population, and and even there, it's concentrated in two countries. There's over a billion people in China and over a billion people in India. So we can see that the uh, the uh, population is not evenly distributed. In some places, we have much denser populations than other places. When we look at population density per square kilometer, so this is the number of people per square kilometer, and we can see uh, that we have this density in uh, India and China and Japan over, so we have India here, get a better marker here. We have India here, we have China here, we have Japan. Um, but we can also see that there's very high population densities in a lot of coastal areas. We like to be along the coast. You have a, a good supply of uh, good supply of fish and seafood, and obviously it's good for navigation. So having um, uh, higher population densities along the uh, along the shores, the coastal areas, uh, has been traditionally favorable. And, and then even if we look just in the United States, we can see the population densities in the eastern United States are much higher than the population densities than in the western United States. So, so in the eastern United States, uh, we have higher densities, but then we look through the west, it's lower densities, um, except for when we get onto the the west coast there, and then it gets high again. And then you look up here in Alaska, and Alaska has extremely low population densities. Um, so on a state-by-state -state basis, we can see it varies. New Jersey has approximately 470 people for, per, per square kilometer, um, and we're the most dense state in the country. And then Alaska has a population of about uh, 470, or sorry, uh, has a population density of one person per square kilometer, uh, so is the least densely populated uh, state. We've talked about population distribution and population density, but when you look within the population, the age structure of the population uh, is different in different places around the world as well. And so this is looking at um, something known as a population pyramid. And it's an age distribution for human populations. And the way these graphs are set up is that on the x-axis, on the right-hand side, you have the number of females in the population. And then on the uh, left-hand side, you have the number of males in the population. And the scale on this particular graph, for those we can see, 
the millions of females and the millions of males in this population. Um, and there's a second country over here with millions as well. But sometimes you'll see it as a percentage and you often will do it as a percentage so you can compare quite different countries. Um, and then the, the y-axis up the middle has uh, been broken up into different age classes, uh, different age groups. And these are the age groups shown on the, the graph. They're five-year age groups, but uh, you can do 10-year age groups. It just depends on, on what data you're working with. And then it's just a bar graph. So, so the right-hand side, you would have uh, the number of of uh, females under the age of five in the population. So you see, okay, it's this number right here. And then you have a little bar for that one. Um, and then you'd have the number of females ages uh, five to, or six to, to five to nine. And then you have the number of females that are 10 to 14. So you have each one of these little bars going up your bar graph. Um, on the left hand side, you have the same thing, but then you start with the, at the bottom, you have the baby boys under the age of five, and then you have the, the boys that are in the age group five to nine. Then we have the age group 10 to 14 above that. So that they, the two sides of the graphs are, are showing you the population of males and females. And so, uh, typically in a less developed country, which is shown on the left here, uh, we find that we have kind of like a pyramid shape. And that pyramid shape, this is showing the data from uh, 1985 projected to 2025. And we can see that we had um, in 1985, we had a huge amount of the population is in these lower age groups, which are the age groups that um, are the kids and they're going to be entering their reproductive years. And so since we know they're going to be, as they get older, we know in the future that they're gonna have kids and that, that is a rapidly growing population. On the right-hand side, uh, the distribution is much more of a column and uh, this is more typical of a developed country, a more industrialized country. And there you can see uh, you have relatively uh, small numbers of children. Uh, so in the in these uh, lower age categories. So it means that your population, because you're having relatively few children, is not growing very quickly. In your textbook, they show you uh, three population distributions for three quite different countries. And so this one is looking at Hungary. And Hungary, you can see, uh, we they're not having very many children down at the bottom part of the graph. So we can see that down in these lower age categories, these younger age categories, um, there's very low birth rate. And we can see the birth rate in this population is 0.01. Zero, um, and then uh, because the birth rate is is uh, lower than the death rate, the death rate is 0 0.013. Then the growth rate of the population is negative. So this is a population in decline. So when you have um, the shape where it is narrowing at the bottom in the age classes of the children, we know you don't have enough children in the population to keep the population going. The second one is looking at Sweden. And with Sweden, we have um, an age distribution that is uh, much more stable. Um, if we look at the birth rates and the death rates here, they are equal, which means that you're having just enough children here to replace the people that are dying every year. And because of that stability, um, you would predict that the population is not growing, that it would have a growth rate of zero. And then we're in Rwanda here. And with uh, Rwanda, we can see that the population birth rate was over twice the death rate. And as a consequence, the country's annual per capita rate of increase, which is what R is, is zero point zero two seven, which is a strong positive growth rate, growing at a rate of 2.7% a year. 
And uh, so knowing this, you know that you have a large number of uh, people entering that population that will be needing jobs, that they will be needing food, and they'll be having their own families. So this, this is showing you that uh, all of these kids down in these bottom age groups are going to be moving up into the higher age groups and be uh, causing that population then to have more families and more kids and more population growth. In general, when you're looking at these population pyramids, then these bottom age groups under the age of 20 is your critical cohort. If you have a, a large number of percentage of your population down in this critical cohort, you know that your population is going to be growing. Even if they only decide to have two children per family, there's just so many families that that population is going to grow. And because we know that, um, we talk about what is called population momentum. Let me get a pen here. Pop. There we go. Population Momentum means that because you have a large number of people uh, entering their reproductive years, your population is going to grow. So the population will grow because you have a large percentage of children in the population. Um, whereas on the right-hand side in a more developed um, country, you'll find much more of a column shape. The, the, the critical cohort is very small at the bottom here, which means that your population is probably not replacing itself. Um, so this is going to be more indicative of a declining population. We've talked about the distribution of the human population, the abundance of the human population and density in different places. We've talked about the age class structure of the human population. Now let's look at the population growth here, since the age class structure gave us some hints about some of these uh, growth parameters. And if we look at this graph, we can start with uh, Rwanda, which are the, the yellow dots. We can see uh, in 1960, Rwanda's population was much smaller than the population of either Sweden or Hungary. Hungary was actually at the, the top of this. And then uh, the population of Rwanda grew rapidly. We can see a little uh, drop where the Rwanda genocide occurred, which was a tragic um, incident where a tragic period in Rwanda history where 800,000 were killed. Uh, we can probably expect to see some blips like that this year in uh, populations for, for uh, many countries that are, including us, that are dealing with uh, coronavirus. Um, during this period, then, we can see the uh, Rwanda population surpass that of both Sweden and Hungary. Uh, and then we can see that uh, Hungary's population actually declined. Uh, so we can see that the, the birth rates were, were uh, lower than the death rates and uh, the population uh, has, has declined and certainly uh, much more uh, stable at this point. The Swedish population, remember we found that with Sweden we had the uh, birth rate was less than the death or the birth rate was equal to the death rate so it should be stable but it was still climbing and what you have happening in Sweden is we don't just have we've been dealing with birth rates and death rates but we still have to talk about immigration of people into a country and emigration of people out of a country and with the immigration into Sweden we can still see that there is some population growth actually occurring there. So if we take into account immigration and emigration, then when we have the uh, population at a given time is going to equal the population in the previous time period, and then we can add in births and immigrants, and then we take out, so they have negative signs, deaths and emigrants, people leaving the population.
I'm <laughs> showing you the graph on the left, showing you that how steep the population growth is, that it's steeper than uh, the population growth uh, would be if it was exponential. But one of the things we notice in this uh, curve is that it's not getting any steeper now. It's, it's not um, sort of shooting up quite as quickly. And we can see it's starting to uh, deflect a little bit from getting steeper and steeper. And, and that's a good sign because it's showing you that global population growth is still occurring. It's not growing um, as fast as it was. It's not growing exponentially. And it's declined substantially over the last 50 years, um, the growth, the actual uh, annual growth rate. So um, when we look on the graph on the right, there's two graphs put together on here. So uh, we've got the year across the bottom, and we have in purple, this is the global population in billions. So this obviously projects into the future. So we're somewhere in here on, in 2020. So this is the, the line that's going up. We can see that the uh, population uh, has uh, continued to grow. But if we look at the annual growth rate, the annual growth rate is shown in blue. Um, there was the horrific famine in China in the 1960s. Um, but then, which I think uh, was like somewhere around 30 million uh, Chinese died between 1958 and 1961. Um, but uh, we can see that uh, the even without horrible famines and things like that, the annual growth rate globally um, has been going down. So since that, that growth rate is going down, um, it means that uh, we are projecting that the global growth rate will decline um, by oh, probably to less than 0.5 percent by 2050. Um, but there's so much going on, and, uh, and oh, as we can see, we've got this horrible pandemic, so uh, things, things can change from these projections. If you've been following along these Chapter 11 uh, videos, um, make sure you, you take a look at the review questions at the end of the chapter. Review questions 1, 6, 8, and 9, I think you should be able to answer based on what we've talked about. And then within it, each of the sections of the chapters, uh, take a look at these concept review questions. And uh, we just talked about the uh, human population appendix. Also, flip to the back of the book, um, investigating the evidence in Appendix A, take a look at number 11, because that is about how we estimate the number of species in the communities. We've just been talking about the number of individuals in a population, but uh, sort of broaden your knowledge and, and take a look at the, the number of species. The next chapter in the, the textbook that we're going to be dealing with then is we are jumping to chapter 13 and that is on species interactions and competition and we will be going over the Lotka volterra competition equations and how those work and talking about some of the lab experiments and field experiments looking at comp competition. So we will see you then.